Well, I'd like to welcome back everybody in the room and our um, attendees who are online. I think we're in for a great talk by Bill Banfleth right now. And for those of you who don't know Bill, um, he's a professor of engineering at, at Penn State. In fact, he holds a whole bunch of engineering degrees, at least from one of my alma maters, University of Illinois. You know, I don't know about you, but I knew it was time to leave when I got up one morning and said, boy, doesn't it smell lovely? Anyway, that's- Oh, it's those farms, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's because right in the middle of the farm fields. But um, his research interests are include energy efficient control of indoor air quality, in particular control of indoor bio aerosols with filtration. And he's gonna talk to us today about why standards, guidelines, and regulations matter. Bill. Hey, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, hello everyone here in the, the room and uh, online. So uh, I'll be discussing how uh, various types of guidance fit into the picture of regulating indoor air quality and uh, uh, indoor chemistry related uh, issues in particular. My, my involvement with indoor chemistry, it's kind of tangential. I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Um, I have industry experience. So I've been a practicing consulting engineer, but I'm, I'm not uh, a chemist or a chemical engineer or even an environmental uh, engineer. Um, I teach indoor air quality to students who are going to be designing and operating systems if they're facilities engineers and also to some future building scientists. Uh, I research mainly control technologies. I've done more bioaerosol than anything else, but I've, I've looked at uh, gas phase and, and particulate control as well. Uh, I use standards as a practitioner in my consulting, and I've done a lot of work in professional uh, organizations and in uh, service to various private and public organizations. So uh, I, I help shape, I think, the IEQ and IAQ agendas of those organizations, and uh, advocacy has increasingly been an interest of mine because ultimately I'd like to see something actually happen. And I've, I've been working in this field for 40 years and uh, not enough has happened yet. All right, so uh, a, a little disclosure on my role with this project. I was a member of the consensus committee that wrote this report, mainly involved in chapter five and chapter six. Um, and also I was the chair of the Clean Air Act Advisory Committee working group that wrote the report that uh, Vito referred to this morning, which tried to extract the practical short-term research agenda from, from the NASEM report. So I've been pretty intimately involved with this and I've worked with a lot of you here in the room over time. So I wanted to start out with a little uh, perspective on what standards, guidelines, and, and regulations are. I, I, uh, I probably will say less about guidelines than standards and regulations, but I needed to have three things for my title, so I included guidelines too. Um, guidelines uh, are typically documents that uh, describe good practice, and uh, they're kind of inherently voluntary. You don't, don't have usually mandatory guidelines, although this also includes some things that call themselves standards that aren't necessarily code intended. You know, I think some sort, sort of best practices, things like uh, uh, green building and well building certifications fit into that category and kind of bleed into standards. Standards set minimum requirements. People like to, to beat on standards because they're, they're minimums. Well, there is no standard that is not a minimum standard. Nobody's writing a standard to tell you that you can't make a building any better than this. And we're, we're telling you what is the worst building that I can, can uh, reasonably construct and have it still serve its purpose. Uh, so they're written to be enforceable. They're written in language that uh, a code official or some other authority could uh, uh, review and make a judgment as to whether it had been met or not. Uh, but they're not mandatory either unless they're adopted by an authority. That's the way it works in the U.S. There are standards development organizations that make standards, but until someone adopts it, uh, it's just uh, something that could be a regulation. So regulations are rules set by authorities, and they have the force and effect of law. And you see here in the, uh, the graphic on the right-hand side, uh, ASHRAE standard 62.1, that's a code-intended standard. 
uh, that is actually referenced in the International Mechanical Code and other codes. And next to it is guideline uh, 42, Enhanced Indoor Air Quality in Commercial Institutional Buildings, which is a guideline written to tell those who are interested how you could go beyond standard 62.1. So um, all of these sorts of things exist in our sources of information, but we need to know which is which and how to get things done using them. So we have voluntary uh, guidelines. We have mandated minimum requirements. Um, it's not one or the other. We really need both of them because the minimums are necessary to make those who are only going to do the minimum do it. And the best practices are necessary because they help us move things forward over time. So what is the role of, of uh, indoor environment standards? They, they set all kinds of requirements, in some cases for materials and equipment, in some cases for how systems are designed and constructed, how they're operated and maintained. And also they say something about documentation. How do we uh, write up for uh, future use what we've done in the design of a system? Uh, they set minimum acceptable criteria and they very importantly protect the public and professionals. They protect public because an air quality standard is intended to provide acceptable indoor air quality for people who are in, in the building. And at the same time, if a professional who's designed a system or built one uh, is questioned as to whether they did things the right way, they're protected from liability by having followed the standard. And also for manufacturers who, it's another group that we like to complain about a lot, uh, standards are important because they tell the manufacturers what they need to do in developing equipment. You can't have different standards in every country or every state, or the manufacturers would have to produce different products in the same line for every state. So it actually has a very important role in uh, industry as well. So uh, to reiterate a point I've already kind of uh, touched on, regulation is essential to compliance. They're just the, the vast majority of, of people out there who are in a position to build a building or operate it the first question they're gonna ask is who says I have to do this? So we need to have regulations so that there's compliance and we can't have good regulations if we don't have good standards. Um, standards protect everyone who's involved in the covered activity as I noted, but guidelines are important because they help to pull us forward. So uh, taken all together, standards, guidelines, regulations are a powerful force for change and for ensuring that we do things the right way. Uh, we can look at energy. I always have to look at energy because we haven't done this in the IAQ world because we don't have regulation of indoor air in most buildings. But we've had since 1975 a national code basis standard, ASHRAE standard 90, which is now 90.1 and 90.2 for residential, non-residential and residential yeah. buildings. It was developed at the request of a public group in, uh, in 1975 and it became by law bill passed in Congress, the national code basis. And over the ensuing 50 years, roughly, uh, the maximum regulated energy use of a building per unit area has dropped by over 50% for both non-residential and residential buildings. This is the kind of thing we'd like to see for indoor environmental quality as well. Uh, but we haven't. Uh, the, the Clean Air Act was referred to earlier. When are we going to have a clean indoor air act? Uh, all we need to do is add indoor air to the Clean Air Act we've already got. It's the regulatory authority that goes with it. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to get a copy of the, uh, the 50th anniversary report written by the Clean Air Act Advisory Committee and turn to the end. There's a section at the end on uh, indoor air quality and the quotes here, which I won't read in full, come from that. It notes that, uh, as we all know, that most of our exposures to contaminants are indoors. It notes that the Clean Air Act outdoors has had a 30 to one return on investment. And it says that we really need national indoor air quality guidelines and our standards. So even the, the folks who are advising the EPA on the, uh, the act that regulates outdoor air are saying we need to do something about indoor air. And this uh, article was mentioned recently. We, we have a big uh, scientific uh, advocacy effort going on, led mostly by Lydia Morowska on, on the global level. And we just published in Science another article titled Mandating Indoor Air Quality for Public Buildings. If some countries lead by example, standards may increasingly become normalized. That's the most important thing about this article. It makes some specific res 
recommendations for levels of different contaminants, but the most important message is that we really need to have regulation where for the most part globally we have none today. Uh, I wanted to say a word about uh, prescriptive and performance standards. These are, are words that come up in, in discussion. They're important terms. Uh, a prescriptive standard, as I would explain it to someone, is one that provides specific requirements that if they're met are, are deemed to comply with the intent of the standard. So an example of that would be we have minimum outdoor air requirements for buildings. Um, we have equipment ozone emission limits. Neither of those depends on actually knowing what contaminants are present and what their concentrations are. But yet, if you're a designer who designs a building and it has those airflows, and if you have ozone producing devices that are below the limits, that building complies with the standard. On the other hand, a performance standard is one where compliance is based on achieving a desired outcome. So uh, control limits on specific air contaminants or a, spe a specified level of perceived air quality. Those are the two things that we look at in most air quality standards. So prescriptive approaches tend to be favored by users of the standard because they're the simplest ones to follow, they're the simplest ones to verify, and they limit liability the most for professionals. We can go measure the outdoor airflow, there it is, and you can read the disclaimer in the standard that says that this may not work in every building, but we did what we should, we met the standard of care. A performance path may require more expertise and it can uh, bring a higher level of risk, but I think we're making good progress on dealing with that problem. Uh, consensus, another important word to talk about with respect to standards. Um, part of the world loves consensus and insists on it and, and the other part hates it. Um, but if you want a standard to actually be enacted into law, it probably needs to be a consensus standard, and in the U.S., the American National Standards Institute is the developer of the um, uh, process and the overseer of the process by which consensus standards are, are developed. Uh, key aspects of that are you have to have balanced committees. You can't exclude anyone just because you don't like the way they think. You have to have everyone on board who has uh, a stake in what you're talking about. So it's, it's manufacturers, it's users, it's uh, advocacy groups general interest parties like, like academics. You have to have open meetings. Everybody has to be able to sit in the, the conversation and see what's going on. And you have to have public review and comment with mandatory responses. So I'm chairing a standard committee right now. We're following ANSI procedures. If someone uh, sends us a comment or a, a change proposal, we have to review it and respond to it. We can say, no, we're not gonna do that, but a, a response has to be given. And uh, to follow up on that, anyone has standing to uh, propose a change. So if you want to propose a change to ASHRAE standard 62.1, you can go to the ASHRAE website and submit a change proposal with your evidence for what you're proposing, and you may wind up changing the standard. So it's open. So that's great. This gives us confidence that everyone's had their say, and we've got a standard that uh, uh, will be accepted when it's adopted into a regulation. On the other hand, there are some limitations to the consensus process uh, as well, uh, the normal development time is measured in years, uh, sometimes double digit years, but usually three to five years if you're not in a big hurry and start a uncontroversial standard out of the box. And it requires compromise. It's, uh, it's like the, the Ouija board there on the, uh, on the right. Everybody puts their hand on it and uh, we find out what we've got at the, uh, the end of the process. As, as some like to say at the end of a successful consensus process, everyone is equally unhappy with the outcome. And so it's not a great tool for activism. If you really wanna do market transformation, you need to go some other direction like developing something like, uh, like LEED, for example, which has had that impact and actually ultimately has affected consensus standards as well. So this is uh, a meeting about the uh, National Academy study on, on uh, emerging indoor chemistry, so we need to talk about the, the connection of science to standards, regulations, and guidelines. And we certainly want, as has been noted this morning, to have standards that are, are uh, science-based to the extent possible. But even if we don't have clear science, if we need a standard, someone's going to fill in the blanks. And I can certainly point to places where that happens. You, uh, you, you may not want to believe it, but the, those air change rates that they use in healthcare 
Uh, those are empirical numbers from the 1960s for the most part, and we're pretty sure they work, but uh, the science behind them is actually not very strong. Um, so scientific consensus is important to having uh, standards be developed and be uh, widely accepted. We don't just not make a standard because we're not sure we know enough about uh, everything. We sometimes apply precautionary principle or sometimes just do it because we uh, we have to uh, do whatever it is that that standard governs and, and uh, we improve it as we go along and science improves. Uh, but there's a problem that this issue of needing scientific evidence has become a very uh, popular and successful tactic for stopping anything from happening, as was well documented in uh, Merchants of Doubt by Oreskes and Conway, and also in other books on this general topic. Uh, and the other point I'd like to make here is that good science doesn't automatically uh, change into a standard without some effort. And this is really the, uh, the big issue of my late career, as I've seen evidence pile up and pile up from good science, and I've seen not much trickle through and change standards in a significant way over my professional lifetime. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about um, IAQ standards today and how they address some issues related to indoor chemistry. I might say that they don't really address indoor chemistry at all, they just address indoor chemicals, right? Because indoor chemistry is about chemistry that goes on indoors and we really aren't there yet. And that's one of the things that this report highlights for us. So, so here's the definition of acceptable indoor air quality from ASHRAE standard 62.1. You'll find a similar definition in 62.2 and also in European and other standards. So the main thing that would relate to chemistry is no known contaminants at harmful concentrations as determined by cognizant authorities. The other part of that is subjective acceptability. So um, that's where we are. The compliance path that's normally followed is the prescriptive one, the ventilation rate procedure, so-called, where we specify outdoor air requirements and limit a few contaminant generation rates and have minimum filtration requirements for particles. Uh, there is a performance path called the indoor air quality procedure. Uh, that has been widely ignored for a long time because up until recently, it uh, was on the user of the standard to identify which contaminants were of concern to establish what the limits were, and then to show that they were controlling them. So there's been a major change to that, which I think makes it much closer to being useful now. Now, the other things that we do that are related to indoor chemicals, we've talked about some of these, is that uh, after a lot of hemming and hawing, uh, so the 62.1 committee decided that we could not specify ventilation rates for spaces where there was smoking. This is after 10 years of, of lots of meetings with, that were well populated by tobacco industry lawyers. And, prevented the standard from being published for, republished for 10 years. And we also have special requirements when outdoor air, uh, ozone and PM limits exceed the, uh, the national criteria. So this is what the requirements for the ventilation rate procedure look like. This is a small excerpt from a much larger table. We have lots of different space types that have uh, their uh, activities that are assumed and the occupant density that's assumed. And we have a requirement that's a combination of a, an amount per person to cover the human generated um, emissions and also an amount per unit of area to cover some of the building related emissions. So there's a, a floor, if you will, based on the floor area that is a, a ventilation rate below, which you won't go, but you can vary the rest of it based on occupancy if you're using CO2 sensors or some other kind of occupancy counter. This is the basis of the IAQ procedure as it was revised. So uh, we've got this down to, I haven't counted these today to make sure I remember the number. It's 14 or 15 contaminants, including PM 2.5. And we have limits for, for all of them. So that table 6.5 is new. And, and so now we have a, a list of contaminants that you have to design for and test for post-construction and the limits you have to achieve. So this is really much closer to being some something that someone could apply and not feel that they were taking on excessive liability. There are also three types of mixtures of those contaminants that are covered as well. So I think that's a big step forward, both in terms of having uh, the list of contaminants and also in requiring that they be evaluated after the building 
has been uh, constructed. So that's a good thing. The problem though is there are 15 contaminants here. So do we really have to know what the concentrations of those are all the time? Is this useful for control? Uh, probably not. So the, the question really uh, for operation becomes, what do we regulate? Um, and the other question is, are we going to regulate? We, we right now don't have much regulation past uh, construction. The, the standards we're talking about have sections in them called um, operation and maintenance, but they're not in the code. And if there's no operational regulation, then you can ignore them. But there's been some interesting work recently uh, looking at what is the harm caused by different indoor contaminants in residential environments and an effort to um, identify which ones are really significant in terms of their disability adjusted life years that they generate. This was work that was done at um, uh, University of Nottingham in the US or UK and just uh, published within the last year. So they took a, a list of 45 uh, residential contaminants and got toxicology and epidemiology data on them and developed a harm index per unit of concentration and then looked at the levels in which those are found in buildings and they ranked them. And it turned out that 99% of the dollies were generated by six contaminants and everything else uh, only accounted for, for 1%, so orders of magnitude lower. And what's the top of the list? PM 2.5, which we, we probably could have guessed. And, and after it, is the coarse particle fraction, the PM10 minus PM2.5, and then in a residential environment, the nitrogen dioxide, maybe if you have uh, a gas range, formaldehyde from among the uh, uh, aldehydes, the VOCs, and radon and, and ozone, and that's it. So if we actually can get down to a, a list like this, we're much closer to being able to regulate operation confidently. Uh, ASHRAE standard 62.1 uh, has had for some time a little bit of air cleaner uh, content, but that's been uh, increased. So currently it um, has had for several issues, uh, a limit on ozone emissions by ozone generating equipment must comply with UL 2998, which is 0.5 PPB at the, uh, at the outlet. And uh, UVC devices, and this is based on mercury vapor lamps, must not emit 185 nanometer UVC, which is an ozone generating wavelength. This doesn't do anything for those who are, are interested in uh, uh, far UV, 222 nanometer uh, UVC. Uh, the particulate filter requirements for a long time have come from ASHRAE standard 52.2 that rates them on the basis of, uh, of particle size. And in another addendum that was just approved has added uh, testing of gas phase filters according to ASHRAE standard 145.2, uh, another approved method. So um, some of this development is actually intended to support the changes to the indoor air quality procedure and put requirements into the standard for testing of components that will make it easier to verify that you've actually complied with it. Air cleaner byproduct generation is, is one of the emerging issues that really is not very well covered yet besides um, ozone. But uh, the, the pandemic really brought uh, air cleaners to the fore and generated a lot of discussion that I think clarified how little we knew about uh, not only how well they perform, but also whether they were doing anything harmful as well. And uh, I've been chairing ASHRAE standard uh, 241 control of infectious aerosols. And we've uh, tried to write that standard in a way that would allow the maximum use of air cleaners for microbial control. And that means that we've had to put requirements in for effectiveness testing and also for uh, byproduct uh, production. And right now there are PM ozone and formaldehyde requirements, but those may expand and work eagerly awaiting the ASTM standard that we can reference for, uh, for doing that, that uh, Dustin is uh, working away on. So to, to give you a little idea of, of this issue of, of indoor chemistry from air cleaners, uh, one of the most discussed things lately has been uh, germicidal ultraviolet systems. For a long time, uh, everyone would say, oh, they have no byproducts. They just uh, inactivate microorganisms. Um, 
And for the most part, it may be true that we kind of have de minimis impact from, from these, but uh, it's possible that uh, UV photolysis, the reaction of UV light with, with uh, chemicals in the air and then on surfaces can produce side effects and um, byproducts. And, and that's really been demonstrated. The paper that I'm citing here is interesting um, because of all of the things it's covered, it covers, but it's a modeling paper by uh, Peng Miller and Jimenez at University of, uh, of Colorado. So we're concerned about the direct effects of UV if it gets into the space and people are exposed to it, but we're also concerned about ozone that might be produced and about secondary chemistry. <clears throat> this is a, an interesting figure from that paper. Uh, you see in the upper left-hand block that uh, uh, 254 and 222 nanometer UVC really knocked down the uh, SARS-CoV-2 concentrations in this modeling at, at three different ventilation rates. It's 0.3 air changes per hour on the left, uh, three in the middle and nine on the right. And the, the point that the authors were making was that the, uh, the UV causes other things to be created. And you do see a lot of blocks here where there are contaminants that uh, are at higher levels when we have UV than no UV. But the thing I'd like to point out is that uh, when you look at the second from the, the top left block for ozone, what we see is that the big factor in increasing the ozone concentration is the outdoor air, right? So, so outdoor air doesn't deserve a, a pass either. We have to consider how much ozone it's bringing in. Um, but on the other hand, if we look in the lower um, right-hand corner, we see that there is a lot of secondary organic aerosol production that's associated with the UV, particularly the, the 222. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. We aren't to the point yet of putting it into standards, but uh, I think we're, we're getting there. And then all of this scientific evidence is, uh, is helping us think about what we need to do next. So uh, what's left to do in the, the, the standards arena? Well, there's, there's a tremendous amount, but these are just a few things. Um, one is to assess the, the recent indoor chemistry work to figure out what effects are significant enough that we ought to do something about them. A uh, second one that's really crucially important, and this was highlighted in, in the uh, NASEM report and in the EPA report on the NASEM report, is that the, uh, the testing issues for air cleaners need to be resolved, both effectiveness and safety. Uh, I think that uh, making performance standards the norm is where we have to go. We've, we've got decades of, of uh, treating outdoor air as if it equals indoor air quality. And there, there aren't any studies that really have established the connection between the level of outdoor air uh, supply and the level of infection risk. We just know that more tends to make uh, outdoor air tends to make infection risk lower, for example. Um, I think we need to move beyond the outdoor air plus filter approach of our uh, standards and, and codes to an equivalent clean air approach where we look at what the effect is of all of the different controls we're using, whether it's outdoor air or recirculating through a particulate filter or sorption or UV, and we aggregate those into a single value that you can design to. This is really going to help us have better air quality with uh, the minimum impact on energy use. The, a unit of outdoor air to do the same job you could do with an air cleaner is gonna cost you 10 times the amount of, of energy. I think we also need better quantitative metrics for assessing IAQ that consider uh, net benefits and well-being. We've focused mostly on harm and we haven't looked at this uh, balance between what good is being done and what harm might be doing being done and how could we mitigate that. Um, regulations for O&M in public buildings during operation, I think they're essential. If we don't do that, we're gonna continue to have mediocre indoor air quality for, forever because that's the only place that indoor air quality problems occurs in buildings that have been built and are, are operating. And construction is a good start, but it's, it's nothing but a start. And as was discussed at the beginning of the day, I think equity issues are also very important and we need to look at those uh, as well. There, there are inequities in the access to uh, a good indoor environment. So that's uh, what I have to offer and look forward to uh, discussion. Thank you. Bill, that was a fascinating um, and very comprehensive. 
presentation. Um, I have to say that I did enjoy those chapters, especially when I had to review that document that is, there are copies of it outside for everyone. I think Paul was one of the other reviewers. So, I mean, so much was covered in that. But um, we really don't have time, I'm sorry, for individual questions, although yeah. if anyone wants to ask you one when you're part of the panel, all right, great. I would like to invite all the panelists to come up and join me for this afternoon's discussions, which again are going to continue to focus on the issues of standards, regulations, and guidelines. Do we have everyone here in the room? Yes. Yes, this is great. <laughs> We're really happy to have you here in person. Um, I look forward to a very robust discussion that we can have. Um, what I'd like to do is start by asking each of you, Jacob, you're sitting here, so you get to go first. <laughs> um, I'd like to just go down the line and have you all just kind of give you a um, brief introduction of who you are and uh, kind of what you see are some of the key issues that we want to address here. And introduce your, give your names. <laughs> you got it. Thank you, Linda. And uh, thank you all for the invitation to be here. My name is Jacob Cassidy. I'm the uh, Director of Government Relations at the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. AHEM represent, is a trade association based in Washington, D.C. here, and we represent over 160 companies that manufacture more major portable and floor care appliances. So when you think about uh, the products in your home, if you went to a retailer and purchased it, and it's not a computer, and you were able to install it yourself, or they delivered it like a washing machine, it's probably one of our products. Um, so it's a, it's a wide span. Uh, expansive products, which includes um, room air cleaners as well. So something very topical to this conversation. Great to be here, and I look forward to hearing from others. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mark Rodifer. I'm with um, the Sierra Club, and I work on our building electrification efforts to transition buildings off of fossil fuels and onto efficient electric systems uh, like heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. And I do most of my work um, locally here in DC, but I'm also involved with our um, national, the Sierra Club's national building electrification campaign. And I'm the, the co-lead of, of that campaign. And of course, our primary reason that we want to transition off of fossil fuels is because of the climate crisis, which will require us to completely zero out fossil fuel use in the next 20 or 25 years. Um, but you know, air quality is a major, uh, factor as well, right? When we are setting things on fire uh, for the purposes of transportation or heating our homes or heating water or cooking, uh, we are, uh, you know, there are chemical reactions going on and uh, there's stuff that it's putting out that we're breathing in. And it's especially harmful indoors as I, you know, as we learned during COVID, right? When there's nasty stuff floating around in the air, it's a lot worse indoors um, than it is outdoors. And we also learned during the COVID pandemic that, you know, you may not be able to see it or smell it, but it doesn't mean um, that it's not there. And so that's why we're working to try to transition off of uh, off of fossil fuels altogether, but specifically burning fossil fuels in buildings because of both the climate impacts and the air quality impacts and uh, the resulting health impacts. Hi everyone, I'm Nina Prescott. I'm an associate at RMI. Um, RMI is a nonpartisan nonprofit that focuses on transitioning to a clean energy economy. Um, I'm on our carbon-free buildings team, and so um, our work really focuses on uh, decarbonizing our buildings, and specifically my team focuses on ways to decarbonize our buildings while improving health and air quality outcomes. And my work uh, has focused on indoor air quality protections and policies um, in the U.S. at the federal and state level. In October of last year, our team published a report called The Need for U.S. Indoor Air Quality Guidelines, where we really tried to summarize the ways that additional guidance about what levels of pollutants indoors are safe, including combustion pollutants, 
um, can really inform a variety of, of policies and practices in the US. And so um, since publishing that report, our team has had the opportunity to speak with partners in this space and decision makers to help support advancements um, towards healthier and cleaner indoor air. Hi, I'm Seema Bhangar. I'm Principal for Healthy Buildings and Communities at the US Green Building Council. And at the USGBC, I'm on the innovation and research team and sit very squarely in this translational space that it's very exciting to be here actually. And I'm rarely in a whole community of translators. Um, and you know, and, and by translator, the, the core constituents, I, I think different people we've heard from through the day are translating into different groups. And, and our core group uh, of constituents at the USGBC is the building industry. So owners, operators, investors, designers, architects, operators, um, that whole gamut, builders, constructors, and then occupants, users. So built environment folks. And we're really looking, you know, at USGBC, we, we run the lead lead um, building, green building standard, which is uh, just following on from um, Dr. Bonflet's talk. This will kind of fit in the rubric for you. It's a, it's a voluntary standard, um, incentive-based. So the theory of change, the idea is that by making performance transparent, we can incentivize action where the regulations have not yet taken up some new strategy or capability that exists in the world of um, science and, and technology and where market forces alone are kind of insufficient to, to create a sufficient push. So we're you know, in that intermediate space. And But I, I would like to emphasize it's something that I've really appreciated since I only joined USGBC a year ago. And you know I joined and, and the first thing I knew about it was, well, it runs lead. Um, and yes, we do, but a, a, a huge part of, you know, lead is just one mechanism of change. And, and really the, the USGBC, not just USGBC, the, the green building movement as a whole, I think the power of it really is that it's, it's creating this community of translators, of champions, of pioneers, of people who are exchanging knowledge, uh, trying out new things, learning from trying out new things, um, being willing to get it wrong. You know, the, the goal with LEAD isn't to get everything exactly right. That's the whole point of having something faster and nimbler um, so that we can push something out empirically, have a big empirical data set, and then see how it works and have you know, people who are really engaged in education and convening and partnerships in policy and advocacy and in the research and innovation. So that's sort of the positioning that and, and mindset that I bring. Yeah, Bill Bonfleth, and I think I'll pass. <laughs> so, unless you want to roll back to the beginning of my slides. Back to you, Linda. So I am going to come up with a bunch of questions, and I actually hope that uh, you will question each other as well. But one of the things I wanted to briefly reflect on is that one of the major recommendations that came out of the consensus report that we've talked about a little this morning is that um, researchers and funders should prioritize their understanding of the health impacts from exposure to specific classes and mixtures of chemicals in a wide range of indoor settings and that this information is necessary to inform any future standards, guidelines, or regulatory efforts. And I kind of want to know what your opinion is about that, because I have a little problem with it. <laughs> well, only that I think that sometimes we try so often to reduce what's the problem to a single chemical or a single kind of exposure when it's not that simple. So I'm hoping that one of you would like to comment on that. Well, I, I don't think it's a single exposure that we're talking about, but but it's the, the question of what what does it all mean? So there are chemicals in the air, particles in the air, and in concentrations. What what really is the 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 impact of of that? We're we're fighting a a, a difficult battle against uh, operating cost and construction cost and and energy use when we can't tell you. What improvements in indoor air quality are are actually worth in in dollars or in uh, quality of life or something else? I think that's why that's viewed as being important. I think one of the the concerns that that I have with I think what you just outlined, which is 
when you focus on one thing, you often see that and you get a little tunnel vision, mm -hmm. right? And that it's nothing is that simple. You can't just say that's the bad guy, that's the bad chemical, that's the bad apple in the bush in the bushel, um, because they all play a role. That's the chemistry of it, right? They play off of each other. And so one of the things that when I see policy or something that I look at is say, you know, it and it it it's what else, what else is there? What's going on? Why is there this correlation? between things and how can you look at the root of the issue instead of just trying to say it's because of this if only we did this then all of our other problems go go away let's just say asthma right well that's just simply you know yes there are asthmagens there are things that cause an asthmatic reaction but that you can limit and mitigate but that doesn't remove the, the chronic illness of asthma and the, the fear of it. Sima, and then, well, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, one thing that our team has been focusing on is just where are the gaps of information might be in the US. And um, there's really a need that we've seen when speaking with state and city level folks to just understand what pollutants they should consider. And so I think that might be a root of where some of these questions come from. Um, and there are various levels of information that I think different um, actors in this space can provide. And so um, to the point of consensus around um, indoor air quality, there's an opportunity to adopt a baseline understanding of what levels of common indoor air pollutants are safe indoors. We've seen this increase really rapidly with some specific risks like wildfire smoke or COVID, but there's many pollutants in your in your home every day that um, you know are at certain levels and folks really don't know um, really how to understand or um, or mitigate that. And so I think um, at the federal level and at the state level, there's an opportunity to increase guidance generally, um, voluntary guidance around pollutants that can then act as scaffolding for some of those more complex considerations um, within standards and regulations. And so providing that foundation, like we've seen globally with the World Health Organization, Health Canada, and even in some states like um, California and Illinois who have indoor air quality guidelines, that's a really great place to um, fill a gap and begin understanding that baseline that we can then build off of. Sima? Yeah, I'll add really fast that I think it's a yes and, uh, because I think a health-based standard is really powerful and, and powerful in a very unique way. I think in the morning we were discussing radon, or if you think of other single agents like formaldehyde that have a very deeply established health evidence base. They, it can lead to a certain level and, and style of action. But I think we can't stop there because of the reason maybe you were alluding to that we're just, you know, especially anyone who sat in on, on workshop one and two, hopefully has taken away, I took away, is that it's, uh, Dr. Leslie in the morning was talking about this too, that sometimes it feels like all our standards depend on what our instrumentation is. And as we invent better and better instruments, or in the case of this indoor chemistry program, brought, brought our fancy outdoor instruments indoors, suddenly we're seeing a whole bunch of new chemicals. And then what, you know, will we keep chasing the capabilities of our instrumentation or the capacity to understand new health effects or new, you know, susceptibilities in populations. I mean, I think the idea of a comprehensive and complete health evidence base is a idealized model that, that, that we're always approaching and never actually reaching. And I really appreciated what uh, Dr. Vito was. I, I like that we're saying doctor and first name, by the way, that's a nice, uh, <laughs> nice chat. But Dr. Vito was saying about, you know, uncertainty that we just will we'll never know that there's always questions we can ask and should be asking when it comes to health evidence base. And so we need just ways and we can do it. We, we have ways to manage risk and uh, exposure without knowing everything. And I, I appreciated the conversation in the morning as well around reach and why Europe, uh, you know, on a coarse grained scale is, is 
um, better chemically in general when we um, investigate various scenarios than than the U.S. So, I, I just have to comment a little on that, Sim. I totally agree with you, but I think we, it's not only the technology that keeps better getting better. We get better at answer, asking questions. So at least today, we're asking many questions. For example, the role of communities, the role of society in how people respond. That wasn't being asked 20 years ago. And it still is not asked often enough. I mean, I think some of the discussions we've had all day about the importance of place-based, whether you're talking about community, whether you're talking about um, you know, uh, occupation or anything like that is really important as we go forward. Um, Bill, I didn't know if you had a comment because we're kind of going down the row. Uh, well, I, you know, I'm thinking of, of health in terms of, of, again, converting it into some rough estimate of, of an economic impact because the, the, the thing about indoor air quality is it's not just what happens to you in your building. If you're sick, you have a health care cost that may affect insurance costs if you have to stay home with a sick child who's who's had a, an asthma attack because the environment school encourages it, then you lose work, they lose part of their education. I think if you, you add up all of these costs, there's a justification for a much stronger effort to make progress on what we know about indoor air quality than, than has been the case in the past. And also a case for, for uh, regulatory authority to move resources around to do it because we have have the, the, the split incentives in, in indoor air quality that the who pays for the, the the benefit is not necessarily the one that receives it. So, you know, I, it's difficult to do this, I agree, but uh, we have to. We, we had an ASHRAE uh, indoor air quality conference in 2016 in Alexandria and the theme was, was regulations. And I can't remember his name now, but the uh, the director, research director of the National Council for Healthy Homes was there. And he said, we've, we've got to be crazy. You know, we, we have, have kids who, who have asthma attacks at home in dirty environments. We send them to the emergency room, they fix them up and they send them back to the same environment that created it. Why are we not viewing indoor air quality in a preventive way? I think that that's the kind of thing we're leaving on the table right now. Well, thank you. So, Bill, I'm going to ask you another question, which is, how do we go about turning um, a voluntary standard into a regulation? Well, I've, think, or, let me I've, just... I've thought about this for a long time. I mean, there's there's mechanics to it, but I, I think you, you really have to have a push behind it to make it happen. We're trying to deal with that now with, with 241, which isn't a, an indoor chemistry standard. But um, the public has to, to want it to some extent because um, resistance from the public will, will, will kill a lot of things. So it has to be perceived as a good idea, which means you have to educate. Um, you have to get those who actually approve regulations on board and they're often driven to some extent by what the, um, the public wants. And then you have to view everything you can do to promote the use of a voluntary standard as a step towards it's becoming a uh, a mandatory one. You know, I think we've we've seen that happen actually with with lead that started out voluntary at a very low level, and eventually a few years later we were writing a, a consensus standard 189.1 to essentially embody the, the the minimum lead compliance levels in it. So um, there is a path, but it's a long game. You know, it's it's not measured in political time. We, we can't do these things in two, three years. We need commitment that goes goes beyond the uh, election cycles. Well, I think that um, in terms of, you know, the, 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 the items that I work on trying to get fossil fuels out of buildings, right? One of the key things is that you have to have uh, the right incentives for the building owners. Now, one of the things uh, that uh, various uh, localities have done. It was struck down because of the courts uh, in the Ninth Circuit on the West Coast, uh, but is saying that in new buildings, they have to be all electric. And uh, we have a, a law in DC that says that uh, in the next two years, that all newly constructed buildings have to be all electric, they have to be highly energy efficient, uh, they have to maximize on-site renewables, and they can't use fossil fuels. 
Now, that's pretty easy to do in new buildings because you're starting from scratch. It doesn't add a lot of cost. Uh, and it's, it, as I said, it's, it's not difficult to do. When you're talking about existing buildings, that's a lot harder to do because you're not starting from scratch. It, it, it's not something where, you know, you have some off the shelf solution. I mean, yes, we have heat pumps and other things that, that you know, don't need to be built for a specific building, but how exactly gonna, you're going to use them, you know, it's sort of bespoke for each building, right? So it's, it's, it's difficult to achieve the economies of scale. So that's where I think you need the incentives that I was, um, that I was talking about. One of the things that uh, it's actually on the verge of passage here in DC is, is legislation called the Healthy Homes Act. And so what that does is it says, all right, we've got billions of dollars coming down from the Inflation Reduction Act uh, for various clean energy and climate programs in the cities and states. Uh, DC is getting about $60 million for energy efficiency and building electrification. And the rebates are very generous and they cover uh, a lot of the cost. Um, but they don't cover 100% of the cost. And if you're a low income person, you know, if you're going to cover 80% of a 10 or 15 or $20,000 cost, I don't have the other 20%. So I'm not going to be able to do it. So uh, what our local legislation does is say, okay, we're going to put in some local dollars to make up that difference so that low and moderate income uh, households can make the switch. Now, it's totally voluntary. It's not required. Um, and, you know, there was talk about in the future, do we want to require these kinds of changes? And we definitely need the kind of incentives. You can't force people um, to do something uh, that they can't pay for. So I think that uh, for getting, ex getting uh, the, you know, these dirty fuels out of existing buildings, uh, uh, incentives, which are not easy to do because they're not cheap, financial incentives, I mean, are going to be required. Okay. No other comments? I'll go on to another question. But I think that the idea of incentives, the idea from sometimes it's easier to start from scratch, I think those are really important things to think about as we go forward. Um, so who's accountable for ongoing compliance and ongoing operations of buildings? Bill, and I think maybe Seema could talk about some anecdotal yeah. work. You know, I, I think that's the reason now that the accountability for indoor air mostly stops when a building is occupied. Is you, you have to have a transfer of accountability from the designer and constructor to the, the owner operator. And we haven't done that yet with, with indoor air quality. We've made a lot of progress where energy is concerned <clears throat> with disclosure laws and with performance requirements. I can walk around Manhattan and see the energy report card on, on every building. Um, I, I think my my recommendation to the indoor air quality community is is don't complain about what we're doing about energy. You know, you know, shamelessly uh, try to replicate it. I, I think we need national standards. We need uh, operational requirements that are are similar. Sima, maybe I can provoke a little bit, and I'm hoping Bill, this will make you seek me out after and argue with me. And so I can, I can learn uh, as well, because I think, you know, I had my stint before USGBC for four years was, was in commercial real estate. And I came in as an indoor air researcher, um, very passionate about indoor air quality standards, about making someone accountable and about this mental model that um, you and others today have talked about of the, you know, we have a clean, clean air act outdoors. Why don't we have one for indoors? And I still think we, that, that framework of thinking, I, I agree with, but the, when I picture the clean air act, which is a sort of table of contaminants and levels, and, you know, there's a, there's a centralized management in terms of monitoring and then accountability. I just don't see how that would apply uh, for indoor environments because I think there is multiple jurisdictions of accountability. And I think we need to activate them. Uh, we need to sort of dive, it, what, what I experienced, what I came away um, with, it's a hypothesis, it's a, it's a thought in progress, is that uh, a, a standard really only makes sense when there's someone who's, who can be responsible, who has the Who's, the responsibility needs to be matched to the power to change it and and to the the cost then needs to fall on someone who it's reasonable to put the cost on. And I think in the indoor environment that kind of power and responsibility and um, cost is is 
needs to be distributed and shared. So there's, you know, formaldehyde is sort of relatively easy because usually when you find formaldehyde indoors or, or not usually necessarily, but building products are, are a big source. And so then you can go there, you can create regulations for building materials. Um, and, and so I think for each kind of different class or group of uh, sources, there's particular mechanisms um, that you can activate to create accountability, pockets of accountability, which then added up are, you know, equivalent to the accountability that the Clean Air Act outdoors creates. I would agree that we can't do it in exactly the same way. And I would, I would start a lot lower. I mean, no one even seems to care anymore about admitting that they're not doing any maintenance, or they're doing so much less maintenance that they need to. All we're talking about at the most basic level is could your building please comply with the standard it was designed to? And we aren't we aren't even doing that. If we just did that, which ought to be affordable, it's a reasonable expectation, we'd be a lot better off. And then some of these other things would could be worked on over time. Well, you know, that's all possible, maybe, um, when you're talking about large commercial buildings or public buildings, but what about the individual homeowner? How do we um, deal with that? I don't know, I gotta take my car in every year to be checked. I can't drive it if I don't get a sticker. You know, the, the, problem, mm. with, the problem with residential is enforcement. The notion that you could set up a program and it would just be cosmetic, it, it would be for show. So no, that's difficult. I, th I think homeowners you'd approach more from the point of view initially of, of uh, education, but I, I still think it's feasible. Nina? Um, yeah, I'll just add, I think um, because we don't have that much in the way of indoor air quality policy, it's really um, an, a tailored approach, as Bill and Seema were both saying, is, is really important. But um, ideally, adopting a more health protective building codes and standards around indoor air quality is equitable because it allows all buildings um, to achieve healthy indoor air, not just the ones that have the means to do so. Um, and so striving for kind of raising the floor on indoor air quality is the most equitable approach. And so I think worth pursuing that avenue while we're also seeking out leaders in the space who do have the means to improve indoor air quality um, for many of the incentives that were already mentioned by, by Mark and others. Um, and kind of show how to get through the more complicated process of improving indoor air quality that may make that process smoother for those homes that um, where it's more difficult. Um, let, yeah. you, go ahead, Bill, if you want to respond oh, to that. Um, yeah, quick thought. I mean, you can get a tax credit to put PV on the roof of your single family house. You know, if, if we understood the value of, of uh, following an indoor air quality program, in your home, or you get some credit for that. Why, why couldn't we offer that kind of incentive too? So isn't some of this a communications challenge? You know, people understand and they think about ambient air and they think about its problem. And most people don't think about indoor air. Um, so maybe this is an opportunity for some public communication as well. But Jill, you look like you wanted to ask a question. Yes, thank you. I'm Thank you for allowing me to interrupt and ask a question. I first wanted to thank you, Mr. Cassidy, for joining today. I know that um, this is probably a little bit different environment for the <laughs> Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. And so thank you for being here. Thanks for being part of the conversation. So my question for, is really for you is, you know, your organization, the manufacturers, is trying to balance designing and manufacturing products that are uh, cutting edge, exciting, useful, safe and healthy. And how do you balance the safe and healthy with what consumers want when they want something that's new, exciting, and cheap? <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot there, um, but let me thank you for um your kind comments. And I'm also, uh, for, just for the audience's sake, um, I'm here. You usually would get a scientist. Um, so forgive me for my, um, my lack of 
science structure uh, or ba background. Um, it is our annual meeting right now. And so everyone is away. Um, and so uh, that's that's why I was, luckily I was in town and someone was able to to, to come here. So thank you. But um, it, is a, it is a delicate balance and we are, uh, as all trade associations are, a, a team, a, a, a group that's organized by competitors in a fiercely competitive marketplace. And so one of the things that we do is serve to um, work with our members, work with um, you know their outside organizations as well to create standards, to um, to create um, I think a way for manufacturers to know what they what they can do and how they need to do it so that it's as um, so that it's as you know uh, safe and and practical and usable for the for the consumer i think um you know one of the things just because we are talking about decarbonization you know i'll just finally dive in and say we sell induction stoves we sell electric stoves we sell gas stoves and our concern is while you know the, this isn't a comment on the decarbonization movement but when the whole debate came down to it's all about gas stoves. That was a huge concern because instead of looking at the whole home, instead of looking at cooking and PM 2.5 and well, which style of cookie or which fuel used for cooking actually releases more PM 2.5, you know, we're seeing that it was electric. Um, and because of residue that stays on the stove, on the cooktop. So, you know, I think making sure that there is something for people to to want to buy, staying competitive, making sure that it's it's safe and and they and they use it properly are, are you know key roles for us. But Jacob, the electric may release more PM 2.5, but the gas releases all kind of nit nitrous oxides. And that's what appears to be associated most clearly indoors with human health effects. So there's there's, there's a whole issue of balance here. There, there are um, as the, the house breathes, it takes in, in indoor, it takes in outdoor air and cycles through the indoor air. Um, as as houses, as as has been discussed, as as they are, the envelope gets tighter, and the circulation of outdoor air to indoor air isn't as you know, drafty as it is in my you know, in my seventy five year old house, um, making sure that whatever you are cooking with, that you are properly ventilating the kitchen, that you are properly ventilating the home, is 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 vital. And it it you know we can we can argue about which one that you know a consumer wants. I've had personally, I've had gas cooking my entire life. I don't have indoor health issues yeah so could i follow I'm, could i follow up with that, that but anyway, well, we, I, can I, never, can I add a comment about that um if i could you know i'm not i appreciate the fact that you stated that you aren't one of the scientists neither am i and i'm not here to put you on the spot or anything or to put you in a position that you need to be defensive so that's not my purpose is all um so thank you for your comments. But my second part is, are you seeing um, a change in in among the manufacturers to prioritize health over maybe innovation of design and cost? And do you think that that health aspect is currently top of mind for some of your manufacturers or maybe not quite there yet? Yeah, well, I, I think I'm going to, First, say with the the design and cost versus health. I think health and and the consumer experience is is number one, and and the consumer experience and their health is also number. Uh, sorry, it it you know their health. If if you're using something that is making you unhealthy, for the most part, humans stop using it, and they, and they switch. They they you know. So there's there's that part of it. So that the, I I think where I disagree is a bit with the premise that the, the design and innovation is more important. Um, in fact, I would, I would, I would ask for an actual 
maybe offline an actual product where you're 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 this this concept is coming from um because again gas cooking has been around we've been cooking with we humans have been cooking with um you know combustion in one sense or another since you know for i i'm not gonna pardon my ignorance since we were in caves okay uh and we only lived to age 35. Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons why we only lived at, you know, age 35. And, and, you know, so there's 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 a lot of factors at play. And that gets back to there's more factors at play than just a gas cooking. Gas Can cooking. I add something? I mean, thank you for your comments. I really appreciate you. Yeah. I, I agree with Jacob that cooking with right. gas well, is a Stone Age technology. May I? Uh, chime in just to say that I, I think it's okay. I see, well, first of all, I just want to disagree with the premise that when something is bad for us, we stop doing it. I, I'm i thinking back to the morning talk about from uh, Leslie M about, you know, beauty care products. And and now I've learned from her how bad they are from, for my health and I'm still going to put on makeup before a panel like this. Uh, and And Dr. Olsuski also declared she's not stopping oxidizing her hair. So I, I think we still do things that we know are bad for us. And that's partly why I think a little bit of Big Brother in this world is, is beneficial because it's helpful when there are systems. Who, who said this, Laurel? I don't know if it was you or if it was Leslie and more. Maybe multiple speakers echoed it that um, it's good when structural when structures are sent, set up, things are solved at the structural level so that it's not always up to an individual to protect themselves and their children or their family or their dependents. Um, so that was one thing. I just wanted to make another quick point about hierarchy of controls is, is how I would look at it um, in terms of house. You know, I also, I'm a renter. I live in an old house. I have a gas stove. I don't have any control over changing it. And I'm very glad to be empowered with you know, other choices in the hierarchy of controls. I always think of source control as the best and preferential, but I don't have the choice to use it. So I'm very glad to be able to activate my exhaust hood and uh, ventilation and run an air filter when my mom burns toast, you know, in the toaster and it's very stinky, which is electric. So I, I think there are multiple sources and, and multiple choices for control, but I, I do feel ultimately, um, you know, we that that source control, there's just nothing, nothing uh, when you can do it better than taking out the source. No more comments, Jacob. Right. Oh, I, can, I can talk all day, <laughs> uh, especially on this. I just, you know, I think, actually, I think the toast example is a great example. Um, that when, when, when something, something burns, when you blow out a match, what do you do? You dispense the fu the, the the fumes. You you spread it out. You 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 dispense it within the home, within the air, whether you're indoors or outdoors. And you know, I just there ultimately consumers have the right to choose what they want to put in their homes. There are ways that we can all work together to make sure that these are safe, that they're energy efficient as as safe, as energy efficient as possible. And that goes beyond, I know the topic is indoor air, that goes beyond indoor air. That gets to um, so many consumer <laughs> safety, because really that's what we're talking about, um, matters here, that it's, indoor air is an important and in part of it. Um, but, you know, as again, as a, as a, as a consumer, I, you know, as someone who owns multiple air cleaners, um, because I, I didn't know what they did until we had a bad issue with with dander and other things. And it was spring. And I was like, I don't know what the problem is in the home. Why my, you know, my wife, my son is clogged up, you know, but let's just let's buy one. Let's see what it happens. And I did the same for my mom in Minnesota when um the Canadian wildfires were so bad. She was, she was having trouble breathing and she's, you know, she was like, this is great. And what I can, what I'm concerned about is as someone says, well, what about the byproducts of that? She says, well, I don't know about this. And I say, well, mom, remember a summer ago, you had trouble breathing. So 
what you know you don't want to use it fine use it when you need to it's your choice it's there and you don't want it anymore that's fine too it is but it was an option i wanted you to try it we did it you know so yes i can talk this whole time that's <laughs> i'm not trying to filibuster um so i'll stop but yeah i mean it's it's a concern nina did you have a comment yeah i just wanted to highlight um you know from my perspective um, and others in the building industry, there's a massive movement and lots of resources being dedicated to transitioning buildings to clean energy. And decisions are being made um, in that space. And, um, you know, in addition to IRA resources, there were $20 billion um, announced from wow. the federal government recently to support greenhouse gas reduction. So these, uh, you know, the ball's moving um, in that space, and there's a huge opportunity to use those funds and resources to make sure that our buildings are also, um, you know, they have cleaner indoor air along with reducing um, emissions for, um, for climate outcomes. So um, it's really a, a health issue and there are funds being dedicated to it that um, we could be putting to use for um, electric systems where a gas system, as the EPA has stated, may um, produce 50 to 400 percent higher levels of nitrogen dioxide that could be avoided in a home that otherwise has an electric appliance instead. And so I just want to highlight that um, I think this is a joint, um, a joint issue, a health issue um, that we can ap approach and take advantage of. Thanks. Thank you, Nina. Laurel? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I love this little debate that's going on. Um, but I'm gonna ask a question about chemistry. Um, you, uh, you represent quite a diverse group um, supporting the larger built environment, right? And and in a way drive consumer behavior. Um, the focus, for example, with the Sierra Club and others around decarbonization, and we talked a lot about carbon dioxide. Um, so there's this larger conversation around climate change, right? That's generally focused around carbon counting, um, CO2, et cetera. What we know about climate change too is that it impacts how we experience chemicals, right? And how our exposures happen. We know that because of the disparities around where climate change impacts occur, right? So urban centers are generally hotter than other areas. Um, and then our indoor environments have also changed over time. So our building materials are different. Um, we now have way more electronics indoors, right? Um, and the way those are built with, um, are different, right? The types of chemicals that I use because they have to be high performance, right? We now walk around with cell phones that are basically computers that don't catch fire. Chemistry makes that happen, right? And so as we think about the chemicals, right, that go into these new products, driving this innovation around changing our built environments to be more energy efficient, et cetera, et cetera, how are you as the trust partners within your sectors um, supporting decision-making around the types of chemicals that are then selected to go into these products where we continue to drive this innovation and lead from the front, right? Um, but are trying to balance this sort of like negative impacts from like off-gassing, you talk about the structure getting tighter, right? So it's it's that, that exchange is also changing because of what we've learned. I'm so just curious, how are you engaging in terms of red lists, environmental product declarations, ex, et cetera, et cetera, in helping your communities where you would trust partners um, to make better decisions? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know if you were asking me or I everyone she was asking everyone so. oh okay sorry so i mean that's my follow-up sitting <laughs> right next to you okay no no i didn't i don't want to dominate this 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 whole thing um now and um 
So that's it's a great question. Uh, one of the things we work with our members a lot on is to make sure that they know what their suppliers are supplying them. And that gets into that can get into contracts, that can get into uh, confidential business information, that can get into other things. And and the the supplier's own sourcing of materials is is also very important. So making sure that they're aware of what regulations, what uh, laws, and what legislation is out there or pending regulations um, is really important so that they have an understanding of what they can use. They can say, are we, well, what they can't use, are we using it? Um, and then they can um, get out of it, um, for lack of a better phrase that's not coming to my head right now, uh, reformulate, if you will. Um, and then we that we can be a partner in that in that kind of eyes and ears and and saying this is what what we're worried about because we yes when when we say home appliances some big manufacturers come to mind but there's also especially in the portable and floor care areas a lot of smaller ones that um, that don't have the resources so that's you know what we do we serve as that extra resource. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so uh, I should have said in my introduction, I didn't, I'm uh, also not a scientist and maybe I shouldn't admit this in this room, but the last time I took a chemistry class was in 11th grade. Um, <laughs> she was pretty good, I thought. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, it would be the Stone Age as well. <laughs> yeah, so it was a long time ago. Um. So one of the things uh, that we have been doing is trying to educate people. I, I don't want to go back to gas. Well, I mean, I am going back to gas stoves, but I'm saying I kind of, you know, I, it, the debate should not be all about gas stoves, right? In terms of, in terms of the emissions, the, the, the climate pollution that we get uh, from burning fossil fuels in our homes, the stove is a tiny, tiny percentage of it, right? If you have a gas uh, hot water heater, that's running 24 seven, right? And um, also, you know, space heating, uh, you know, furnaces and boilers, those those aren't running uh, 24 seven unless you're in a place really freezing cold. Uh, but, you know, they're using a lot more gas than a stove is. So, I mean, it's it's certainly it, I think that the stove issue has uh, gotten more attention than it deserves, especially from a climate perspective. Now, it is a little different from the public health perspective because usually your gas uh, furnace or your water heater is, you know, in the basement or in a closet, or it, you know, it's usually not in a room where like a lot of the family members um, uh, uh, congregate and, you know, sometimes are um, standing directly over it. But so one of the things that we have been doing is doing um, NO2 testing in uh, kitchens uh, of people with gas stoves. There's been a lot of talk today about how, you know, indoor air quality is not regulated. I think it's, um, I think it's uh, 100 uh, parts per billion is the outdoor air standard for NO2. That's a for a one hour um, exposure. And so we have, uh, we uh, are doing a study with uh, several of partners, the Sierra Club and some interfaith groups and some others, where we're testing people's um, uh, kitchens in Washington DC and also in Maryland. And we asked that we asked them to turn on a few burners and uh, we have a, 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 a little device that we put uh, about three or four feet from the stove that is measuring NO2. And, you know, the readings are really all over the place. Some of them are like 50 parts per billion, which is below the outdoor uh, uh, level. Some are as much as 200 or 300 percent. So you're talking about, you know, three times uh, what is uh, what is the limit outdoors. And of course, this is indoors, so it's a lot worse. Uh, when when it's inside and you know we have heard a lot and and jacob was talking about this there's a lot of people who you know they like their gas stoves and they say i love my gas stove and you know we're not trying to take it away from anyone who doesn't uh, who doesn't want to get rid of it but uh to the point about people will stop using something when they know it's unhealthy well a lot of people don't know it's unhealthy right like i was saying you can't smell it you can't see it you think there's nothing wrong with it um, and then, you know, if you're having respiratory issues, you don't necessarily know why. And of course, there, you know, there are cumulative impacts. It's, it's probably not solely one thing that is causing it. Uh, and so what we have found is when we have been educating people about this and we say, well, you know, your, yours is, you know, 275 parts per billion, and that's almost three times uh, the outdoor uh, level, uh, people get uh, are concerned about it. And they, you know, maybe... 
the, the gas stove that they talk about how much they love, maybe a little bit of um, love is lost uh, for it. But I think it is really important for people to know the impacts, and it's not information that is readily available to the average household. Nina? Yeah, so um, I don't specifically delve deep into building materials, so I'll keep it brief, but um, a couple of solutions that we've seen to increase the understanding of the health impacts of building materials indoors have been warning labels on um, some products. So um, whether that's EPDs or um, warning labels on appliances themselves, I think it's um, California and Washington may both have warning labels on stoves, but there's other instances of that that I think could be models um, in the in the building space. And then also product safety assessments. Um, and so it, in the report that we wrote at RMI, um, we did mention that one application of indoor air quality guidelines would be um, using those really health-based indoor-specific um, limits on pollutants to help inform the ways that we assess products in our homes. I'm going to use this opportunity just because it's so timely. The our V5 of the LEED rating system was released for public comment last week, uh, a draft. So instead of trying to uh, remember what's in there uh, for materials and for other indoor air quality uh, controls. I'm going to invite everyone, please go 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 in there. Um, you know, part of the power of LEAD is that it is this, it attempts to be an open, transparent, uh, kind of robust conversation driven process. So we would really appreciate um, people going in there and, and looking. And, and giving input. But a couple of quick things I, I will pull out. One is that for uh, low emitting materials, we uh, lean on the CDPH standard. I believe it's 13, what is it? I'm not gonna be able to pull it up. Something 1350. Um, and um, so that's what, and, and there are points in the lead system for, for that. So we're also in the world of disclosures and, and, and labeling. Uh, and then another tool that's not, uh, USGBC tool, but that I've gotten really excited about and, and we're thinking of working with to develop a pilot credit around. Pilot credits is, a, is another way we kind of push new strategies out into the market is uh, developed by Healthy Buildings Network and they call it the informed tool. And they've um, come out with it in part as a response to the inadequacy of you know disclosure and disclosure-based controls and um, so they did, their scientists did a, a very in-depth review of different building materials and what uh, constituents, all the disclosures that exist and, and came out with a, a top-down kind of traffic light based approach that is very accessible. So you can go onto their website if you're a you know designer and you want to spec some flooring and you can just put in flooring and get a sense of what's green, what's red as, as a product category. So you're not looking, the problem with disclosures is they become very brand and product specific. So you kind of go, you know, one by one by one by one. And this allows you to take a little bit of a top-down view like that. So um, I would encourage people to look at that as well. Bill? Well, I think um, in my part of the construction industry, we're, we're already down to the engineering controls level of the, the hierarchy of controls. But I think that you know one of the successes of the, the green building movement is that pretty much everyone who's involved in the process understands that reducing emissions of controlling sources is, is the best way to have a high performing building. And I think, although it's not mandatory, that's uh, something that's done. You, you do need to to uh, reassess periodically to see whether things have changed. And it, you know, it goes both ways. From the point of view of emissions, I think overall emissions from buildings are lower. And some people have said our, our ventilation uh, quantities are, are now more conservative than they used to be because they used to be intended to control the, the emissions from buildings that were built as uh, they were built decades ago. On the other hand, thermal comfort and, and uh, uh, temperature set points, people are a lot bigger than they used to be. And then, so we've got guidelines there that need to be reassessed. So, you know, for us, it's really uh, keeping up with with what's going in into buildings and making sure that that the controls are adequate. Uh, Vito, you've been patiently standing a while. I'll ask a question. Thank you. I, I have um, a, a comment and a question. Um, I said this morning I wanted to acknowledge uh, the way AHAM has been 
uh, directly approaching um, uh, EPA in particular mm -hmm. for the development of uh, their standards. And and I didn't have time to really elaborate on that, but but I think I really want to underscore how important the development of a standard for air cleaners with a clean air delivery rate is in uh, in the field and in, in our ability to give advice try to shop for an air cleaner in a place that doesn't use cadr and you will see what i mean um and and uh, also been very active with other upcoming standards for for other types of, of, of products so thank you for that and and definitely you see that aham is in fact here at the table and but there are all sorts of other products that affect indoor air chemistry and from the building materials to the cosmetics that we talked about today. And my question is, uh, what, from a, the perspective of what government agencies can do, public health government agencies, what can be done to make uh, manufacturers or other product designers want to approach public health agencies more or what other mechanisms can you see? And I'm not just asking um, for AHAM, but everyone's thoughts. What approaches, what can government agencies do more or better so that public health considerations come into the production of standards for, for products of, of any kind? Thank you. Great question. Anyone want to take that? Let me just really quickly dive in and say thank you for the the, the kind words. Um, yes, uh, but one of the uh, with the, with EPA and air cleaners and the CADR rate and, and all of that. Um, but what what I want to want to say and piggyback on that with is that what's important is that just there's there seems to be a notion out there that if it's coming from industry, it's it's because of a profit. And it's not, if we are in a capitalist society, we are profit driven as a people, um, as a, as a country. Um, but what's, what's important, we, we all have a role though. And to simply say, you're not at the table because you're not, your concerns may not mesh with my concerns really makes it um, a one-sided conversation. And, and then you don't have the manufacturers to say, oh, this is why we need to do this. And this is why this makes sense. So not having manufacturers at the table, have them engaging, have the public health agencies engage manufacturers, maybe the trade, maybe the manufacturers prefer the trade associations, everyone's different, but just no saying that, well, you know, we, your val your comments are not valued because of X, Y, Z does a disservice to the entire conversation. Okay, we, we are getting very close to our deadline. Um, we do have an interesting question from um, our online viewers, which has to do with differential sensitivity of different populations and actually different individuals. And so the question is, um, how can you say there's not a problem if, you haven't looked at some of the most sensitive population um, related to health effects. Start with me. <laughs> well, oh, I'm are, happy to. I'm happy to. Welcome no, 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 and that's that's why. To look at you. Uh, that's uh, next time. Next time, if I get invited back, I will <laughs> say. No, well, I sat next to Linda last I'm time. Looking at Nina, but you're welcome. To oh, okay. I, I would just say that you know it's it's just not a one size fits all. And that's, that's, that's we, we have to make sure that everyone has the ability to live in a clean and healthy environment. And I don't know what that is for the individual home. I know what it is for mine. And that's what I strive. Great answer. Nina. Yeah. So I think ideally um, we would be setting some sort of voluntary guideline about what pollutant levels are safe that do protect the most sensitive populations. Um, because when you protect the most sensitive populations, you protect everybody. Um, I realize it's much more complex than that in some instances, um, but there are examples out there like from the World Health Organization of ways that they've assessed pollutant levels that um, try to mitigate any and all risk versus some other guidelines that take into um, take feasibility into consideration and, and may have 
a higher limit. And so I'd say um, similarly to Jacob um, striving for protections that are, um, you know, health protective for the most sensitive groups is, is my recommendation. So I'm going to raise one last two-part question that we will we'll go down, but this time we'll start with Bill rather than Jacob, who has been so understanding. Um, and it's kind of a two-part. First of all, what do you see as the most critical indoor science thing that should be considered for immediate public health messages? And that kind of goes along with the idea of what we've learned. So what do we target now? Bill? <laughs> what do you think is the most important science thing that we still need to know? And should we be targeting that now? Well, I think we need a lot more research on the relationship between exposures and 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 effects on on occupants. You know, for for all of the effort that we put into controlling indoor air quality, we're still not very clear on, on how much the things we're doing are helping, and that applies not just to chemical exposures but also to controls for for uh, airborne disease transmission. So I, I think we need a lot more resources put into research to, to look at those sorts of issues. Otherwise, it's hard to tell whether we're doing anything useful. Okay. Seema. Yeah, I want us to be really taking seriously that we have a moving goalpost that we're planning for. And, you know, sometimes I play over in my head, plan for the future, not the present. And it sounds so obvious, but I, I feel in the standards and regulations world, it's so hard, especially because some of these really getting things codified takes time. And so it just feels like we're perpetually behind the curve. And I think, especially at this moment, um, it, we're just in a rate of change with, with climate change. I think, Laurel, some of your comments pointed at this, with, with climate change is creating such different risks and conditions uh, than, than we've been used to, not alone the temperature, but moisture conditions, uh, wildfire conditions. And then at the same time, we're, we have some pretty ambitious targets for decarbonizing the building sector, as you were talking about, Nina. And if we, if we meet those, to meet those, we're going to have to also create a lot of change, engineering change in our buildings. And so um, things are going to, you know, so I, I want us to, I'm really interested in how we can be planning for that and not for what is now um, and, and how to do it in a way that I'm sort of just done over the the idea of planning for the for some sort of hypothetical average person, um, which I think we've all and today's uh, so many talks today have reinforced this that you know there are extremes in the distribution and we should just go after those and and often that makes it easier in a way because the the amount of doubt we can have sometimes when we're looking at you know small marginal improvements for already good conditions can be much higher and we can debate about what's the exact thing but like when there, there are conditions that are so extreme that um they leave us in no doubt so we should we should just really go after those right nina yeah i think um building off of bill and Seema's points um really being proactive um, and as health protective and indoor specific as possible is um, is really important. We've seen, as I said before, some um, additional surges of information around specific risks like wildfire smoke and COVID, but there are ongoing risks in your home um, every day that I think we can um, strive to, to mitigate. And so um, with that, I think combining initiatives like um, air pollution and climate um, and health together and realizing that it's really just one issue um, can be really critical. And I'll also just say um, in relation to combustion, one of the pollutants I really haven't seen in a lot of the guidance um, from decision makers that I think um, is important is nitrogen oxides. Um, we know that those are highly associated with respiratory illnesses um, and combustion and, and may be able to be avoided in some instances. And so um, I think it's, yeah, combining initiatives, understanding which pollutants um, we should be considering in our guidance, and then paying attention to some of the more overlooked pollutants in current guidance. Thanks. Thank you. Mark? 
Uh, yeah, well, building off of what uh, Nina said, I think it is uh, public education about uh, when you are, you know, combusting fuels inside your home, uh, what chemicals are emitted and what the health impacts are, right? I mean, I think people have understood for decades that driving a car pollutes the air. Everybody gets that. I don't think people understand, for the most part, that when you are doing combustion in your home, there are similar uh, impacts. I've mentioned our our kitchen testing effort, which you know is very helpful at educating people. But we're not going to go into millions of people's homes probably and test their kitchen. So I think that education of uh, the chemicals and their health impacts inside of people's homes uh, could be very powerful. Thank you, and Mark. And I'm, I'm sorry, Jacob. <laughs> By the end of this, that's going to you know, no, yeah. Go buy, go buy an alias. No, um, I think the the number one thing that for me is is really is this, as Mark was saying, the consumer education, but really science literacy for the, for people, so that they know what we're talking about and they know that there's a distinction with a difference uh, between what what these things that were just described are that we're just not slapping Prop sixty five warnings on everything because that's warning fatigue for the average person um i as as someone who is in industry and has worked on this stuff i've been with colleagues in california and i've said do you see what that sign is and they said yeah i said that's prop 65 and they didn't they it took them a second they're oh okay now i see it now i see how it is so there's there's just understanding what it is what things mean science literacy is is for me the number one thing because i don't think we can educate before literacy occurs well, that was great. I want to really thank, this has been a great panel, so thank you all. And at this point, um, I'm going to ask Paula to join me, and I'm just going to give kind of two to three themes I heard loud and clear, and then I'm going to turn it off to Paula, and I'm going to run to the airport while she um, gives the final wrap-up. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I, I really did want to talk about. I think number one, we heard again, whether you call it education or science literacy, that's essential. Another thing that's essential going forward is the research needs. We don't know all the answers, not that we'll ever know all the answers, but as we learn more, that will help. And the third thing is individualized. And I mean that whether you're talking about individual buildings, whether you're talking about communities, whether you're talking about producers, or inventors, things have to be put in context. So those are some of the things that I took home from this, what I think has been a wonderful, wonderful day and a nice um, conclusion to a series of workshops that the Sloan Foundation has funded. Thank, Thank you. you. So Linda, now you can run to the airport. Right. <laughs> All right. But I will still, um, <laughs> it's good to see you. And I, I Anyway, so I think this this workshop has really been uh, extraordinary, and uh, I'm sorry, um, Jacob already left because I, I I think that the only way you can make progress is when you have people who have different opinions and represent to to just be able to sit at the table and talk about things. And it doesn't mean everybody changes their minds, but you gain insight. So anyway, all right, so. Um, why indoor chemistry matters is really a, a fabulous, fabulous National Academies report. Uh, it's I've been involved in a number of them, but this is probably my favorite, maybe because that's because I love chemistry. I had a great chemistry teacher. There is a study that shows if you had a bad chemistry in high, teacher in high school, you don't do any other chemistry. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, and the uh, the committee really came up with all sorts of wonderful, uh, huge set of recommendations. And two of the committee members are still here, Dustin and uh, Bill, and I, and I thank them all. And so the um, the report lays out really a call to action, and the um, it it's very hard to read if you're not really involved with the topic to read a report like that. And so Jill, who also had, I guess has already left, the fact that she read the report was great. But I think the, um, I'm grateful to the academies for having these workshops because then the people who are interested in different parts of the problem could, we could really focus on it. And so, you know, I think the, you know, the work, the first workshop about really trying to, you know, um, 
getting funding for it, more indoor chemistry research. The Sloan Foundation got things started, um, but it, we need the this report outlines a whole series of of research questions that I think um, need to be addressed. And um, you know, so hopefully we, the community, will be successful in, in engaging both government funders and other uh, philanthropies to support work in this area. Um, because it, and, and again, why indoor chemistry matters, I think the report. Um, now, another key, uh, I think this was the second one, you know, how do we affect change? How do, you know, what things? And again, if we had no money and no research labs to do any um, indoor chemistry research today, we still, we've learned a lot from this, this program, this report and so on, that I think there are many actions that, uh, that can be taken. And I think they're the actions that, you know, at the building level, the control level and so on. But um, I <laughs> developed the program, um, talk about, you know, occupancy-based behavior. All right, well, as my husband said, are we never using candles again? What about the, what about the fireplace? Wait, why are you always putting that range hood on? I'm gonna go deaf, I got a different range hood. All right, uh, but, you know, just different uh, sort of, okay, so, Combustion in the home, I have it. I mean, it, it, you know, I try to minimize exposure to it, but, you know, and again, so it's uh, it's great if we can minimize oxidation going on in your home, because that basically is what con uh, con um, combustion is. But, you know, there are other things, I, I, you know, cleaning, there's a lot of chemistry associated there. And here's another series went learning from the program when the scientists were following the directions on a bleach bottle and studying what goes on, well, there's a lot that goes on, and and so I think early someone gave the in someone's remarks, so they like say, use this under uh, properly vent, you know, with proper ventilation. Well, well, what is that? I mean, Delphine Farmer showed that. It, um, I, what is this? Oh, all right, I'll, all right, I'll get to that. There, I see there's a question there. All right, but anyway, about why Sloan started the program. But anyway, so the, you know, so I personally, again, so I, I'm living the dream. I'm trying to have better indoor air quality and I'm trying to minimize sources. And so, you know, I, I use, I, I'm very careful about the cleaning products I use. I'm very, you know, just careful about ventilation. Um, I, so there are things that an individual can do, but I'm a well-resourced individual. I can go buy the induction stove and you know what? It's great. And you know why? Because you it doesn't get hot except where the pot is. So there, and you have exquisite control, far better than any other of the cooking appliances I've used. And I've used lots of them, and I love cooking. But anyway, these are my personal reflections on how I per after you know learning from the program. Another thing, learning personal thing, always have your range hood on and put your toaster under the hood, because your toaster creates so many particles. Just asking in advance who did the experiments in home care. Uh, so the, again, so I guess I'm also talking about how we can put things into action. And I'm also sort of reflecting on, you know, um, sort of how my how I've just changed my personal practices. Now, my changing my practices helps me and my family and maybe my friends if they, you know, listen to me, but it doesn't help things systemically. So that's why I'm grateful that now I work at Hopkins where we're trying to really implement policy to, to make big changes. All right, so someone wanted, so the question was, you know, how did Sloan have an indoor chemistry program? All right, when I, I was there for two decades, I'm truly grateful um, for having the opportunity to work there for two decades. And when I first joined, I, I wanted to do a chemistry program right from the start, but I did other things. And so um, I, that's a very long story. Anyway, so I had a program to study indoor microbes. And so if you're looking at DNA or RNA, that's just the potential. And SEMA was in that program, uh, just for example. And you can start the question is, that, well, if, if the DNA is there, does that matter? Like, does it matter? It, what matters if, is if there's function. So we started looking at function 
And so you had to look for chemicals, metabolites and so on. And so that's what, when the uh, first outdoor chemist came in to study micro, help us study microbial metabolites. And then I realized there was a whole um, opportunity of like what chemistry was going on indoors. And so it came out of other, it sort of was like a natural progression of programs to elucidate sort of the chemical and physical transformations um, that are taking place where people live, work and play. And what's interesting is I think we get, you know, I was at Sloan, the first, we gave the first grants around 2012 and I left in uh, 2020, but in developing strategies and so on, learned all sorts of interesting things. And again, most of, they're summarized in the report, but there are things that you could not predict. And so for example, the importance of understanding the indoor chemistry of wildfire smoke. I mean, who who in the Northeast? I mean, of course, I'm from New York. So who in New York ever cared? I mean, that's something that happens out West. Oh, it's like once in a while. All right. So, so understanding and elucidating that chemistry becomes really important because people, as we know, people spend 90% of their time indoors. The other example I'll give, and there, I'm sure there are more about the, why indoor chemistry matters is, okay, we, we just got through the, well, I don't know, have we gotten through this pan, pandemic? I finally got COVID. I missed the last workshop because of it. Anyway, but um, the, if you want to disinfect air, what are, and kill, if you want to kill germs in the air, how can you do that safely? All right. And so we heard a little bit, I think from Bill on the far UV, and that is using certain wavelengths, um, <laughs> let's just call them of light, um, to kill germs. But those wavelengths, and again, this wasn't, when I was developing this loan program and working with all sorts of brilliant people to figure out the strategy, we weren't expecting people to bring light sources at those wavelengths indoors, but it's very important technology to, to evaluate because those light sources produce ozone, all right? that That's what happens. The atmosphere protects us from this There's, and protects us from that uh, wavelength of light, but way up above that, it's like, you know, that light plus oxygen produces ozone. Just now that we're down here on earth, and if, if we have some terrible pandemic, we know we now know people don't want vaccinations, all right? So it becomes, it becomes even more important to think about other ways to protect people protect humanity, uh, you know, against the next pandemic. So again, that the indoor chemistry of far UV wasn't. So I've given you two examples. Um, let's see what the, so I, uh, you know, I'm living the dream, trying to improve my own indoor chemistry, my own indoor environment. And I have the opportunity again, two decades at Sloan did all sorts of um, excite. I didn't, I found the right people and I was able to, um, coax good proposals out of them that were, fun, were were approved by the staff and the trustees of the foundation so I could move money to to do um, ex, exciting uh, research. And, and they have, and in some case, some of the, the Europeans are, seem to be getting money to do a lot. So again, I think we could talk for hours on this. I, I love indoor chemistry. I'm grateful to the Sloan Foundation. I wanna thank them. I wanna thank Evan Michelson, um, who's the current pro program director in this area. This is really an exciting um, area. And I'm, thanks Sloan for, you know, again, supporting all of these things because usually um, foundations just support the report, but the fact that um, can support more than that. And um, I think I covered everything. So I thank you all uh, for coming and I'm happy to talk informally for a while if anybody wants to. So thank you.